your Bibles, if you would, to John 20. Let's stand in honor of God's Word. John 20, I'm just going to read verses 1 through 2. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciples, uh, the one the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Let's pray. Uh, Lord God, <clears throat> Uh, we already know what's coming, so that's kind of our problem. Uh, on this day, uh, about 2,000 years ago, uh, these ladies came to this tomb uh, to, to, to look for you, to honor you, uh, and the tomb was open, uh, and you were not there. Uh, this is, so they, were, uh, they felt despair. It wasn't joyful yet. So Lord, as we study your word, help us to see with fresh eyes again, uh, the, the reality uh, that if Christ had not come, that we would not have hope. And yet what we've come to do today is to celebrate, to stand in awe of the fact that because Jesus Christ died on our behalf and conquered the grave, that we have huge hope, unshakable hope, hope that cannot be broken because our faith is in you. It's not our faith that's so big that matters. It's the object of our faith. So Lord God, I pray that you would strengthen every person who's here or those who don't know you, they draw them to yourself. Those who do, I pray that you just, just solidify and give awe for who you are. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. You can be seated. Now, we went to uh, Mexico a few weeks ago, and I told this at Good Friday. So, uh, But one of the things that was interesting was as we were leaving, trying to fly back, um, <clears throat> the, we were on the runway, and they were going to reroute us. So they'd load tons more fuel, many tons. I don't know how many it was, a while. And it was just the, the line was huge, enormous. Uh, and the the pilot on, on our particular flight was really smart, I thought. And he said, the hero of the intercom, hey, any first-time flyers, we'd like to invite you into the cockpit to come look at things, come see. So we're sitting there, and, the, and then we sit a little bit longer, and then the line gets really huge because no one cared about the fact they weren't first-time flyers. They all wanted to be in the cockpit. And so this guy lets all of these people come into the cockpit and literally sit in his chair. Uh, across ages, across ethnicities, there was, let me tell you what, what I kept seeing as people kept walking back. They were just lit up. They're like, I got to sit in his chair. A guy behind me, a college student, said, he said he's going he's gonna to message me with the picture. It's like he took a selfie with the pilot. I don't know what happened. But, the, but what was, people were just lit up with enthusiasm that they had, listen, access to a place they should not have been. And in case we wondered whether we should have had access, later in the flight, the doors had closed, okay? The window was now closed. And there's, you know, like when you're doing a, a long-distance flight, you'll stand. Maybe you haven't flown, don't worry. There's a place, you just want to stand. You're like, I just want to stand up. I don't want to sit the entire flight. So I'm standing at the front, and one of the flight attendants says, get behind the lines. And I was like, literally not that long ago, you were letting people go into the cockpit but apparently it's a thing, and it was, I understood. I respected them. I said, can I go over here? And he said, yeah, that's fine. But the, I got put back. And the reason is access, right? The pilot let people in. There was, when the door closed, the pilot was saying there, there was no more access. It really mattered to. But what I thought was such a great picture is what Christ has done. He's made it access to the people of God. If you know Christ, if you actually know him, you have access to a place you should never be, heaven. No one deserves it. No one, not a single person. It's access, and the door is opened by Christ. This is just a great picture, but I'm telling you what I, what I really enjoyed the most was the joy that I saw on people's faces for just having access to a plane. And I'm telling you, on, on Resurrection Sunday, what we're celebrating is the fact that because Christ came, and He really did die, and He really did conquer the grave, there's this joy for the believer that this morning... And even in the face of death, you can go, you know, it doesn't really matter what happens. The king has conquered the grave. And forever and forever, the people of God can rest, can have hope, can have joy, can be lit up with, with thrill that we have access to him. John writes his gospel, basically writes, these things are written so you may, you know, know him, you may believe on him. This whole story that we're about to read um, is really the reminder that Christ has been raised. Uh, a few, only, only a couple days ago, on Good Friday, a number of things had occurred. This, this amazing man, who wasn't just a man, surrendered himself. On Good Friday, we talked about this. He surrendered himself. 
He did nothing. He didn't defend himself. Perfect meekness. He receives mocking by, by everyone. People who not that long before were celebrating him are now mocking him and saying, look, if you are who you say you are, why don't you get up off the cross? He doesn't defend himself. Ultimately, silence occurs. He dies. He gives his life. Scripture says that after he gave his life, that there was the curtain in the, in the temple tore from top to bottom. And it was this picture of God interpreting what just happened, that we have access to a place that you could not go by yourself. You could not. You don't deserve to be there, and neither do I. And what God was doing is in, when, in Christ's death, he, he gave access to a holy place, the Holy of Holies. A couple other things happened. The last thing that I said was stone. This monstrous stone was put in front of a tomb big enough to hinder grave robbers. It was a very practical thing. The tomb was rolled uh, and covered with this stone, uh, and it was literally just to hinder grave robbers. On, on that day, there was no hope. The people who had seen Jesus heal, speak with authority like no one else, tell them their own lives and change their own lives, leave this tomb with no hope. They may have they heard the promises. Jesus actually said some stuff, but no one really registered what was going on. Everything really looked hopeless. Today, what I want to look at is just three unexpected clues. Three unexpected clues. How many of y'all have seen Vera on BritBox? Raise your hand. No one? That's fine. You ever seen a detective show that required you knowing this story to solve the puzzle? Raise your hand. Raise your hand if you've ever heard of a detective show. Okay, thanks. Thanks for those of you who are participating. Okay, good. So let me tell you what happened. So, for, so we've been watching Vera. I'm not saying watch it, don't watch it, I don't care. But let me tell you what's, what's really true of a detective story. is they're, they're, they're trying to mess with you, I think. You know, like once you know the answer, you can do all these things. But you're, you're trying to figure out what's happening. You have all these clues. You're like, what's happening? What's happening? And you'll throw this new person. You're like, oh, it's definitely that person. And then something will happen that makes it impossible. But let me tell you this. The true story will explain everything. The actual story will explain everything. And this is actually true on this day. Three unexpected, and that's the key word, unexpected clues occur that interpret what happened on this day. The first was an empty tomb. Look at now, if you would, at John 20. Just 1A, basically. So now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark. So it's still dark. Everyone say still dark. So it's dark outside. It's the first day of the week, and she's, she's grieving. I really think that's what's happening. One person described grief like the feeling of fear. So I described the, the, the fluttering in the stomach, restlessness, yawning. Um, grief makes it hard to sleep. You're trying to finish what's happening. As far as they're concerned, the death, they're trying to just honor him. They're coming back to honor him. They're not coming back to see him. And, and there's, she probably didn't sleep very well. She goes, and she's not alone. John's gospel does a, kind of like a spotlight on Mary Magdalene. Focuses on her, but other people are around. Um, who is she? Well, let me tell you who she is. Uh, Luke 8 talks about her like this. Mary was called uh, Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out. Seven demons. All right? You might not believe in demonic stuff, but let me just tell you, the Bible does. And this lady was a slave to satanic stuff. She couldn't be free until she met Jesus. He literally delivers her from this demonic stuff. And it's this picture of one who has authority over Satan. He conquers this stuff. One of the things, let me tell you, secular scholars, by the way, would know that he was, that was one of the marks that are affirmed. Like they don't believe it was real because they don't believe in the unseen. Okay. But, but he was known to do this. This is one of the marks that they would say, well, a lot of people thought he did that, okay? So even secular scholars, not Christians, would note this. But this lady knew it herself. This lady was a slave. Do you remember, I'm just curious, if you're a Christian, do you remember what it's like to not be free? There's like a bondage. There's a lack of hope. This lady remembered it, and she knew who delivered her, okay? I don't, I may, I don't know anyone present tense, who has been this controlled by Satan. And this lady knew she was free, and she knew who freed her. Luke 8. In the middle of this, as she's going early, while it's still dark, her grief is actually interrupted by a fence. So the first day of the week, she comes to the tomb early. She knew exactly where it was. It's still dark. And it says that she saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. 
So the tomb that they'd heard not that long ago, that was literally meant to hinder people getting in, uh, was moved. She comes to a place, the tomb is exposed. Um, and says, uh, well, look what she does next. Verse 2, she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we, this is where we know that it's not just one little person, we did not know where they have laid him. She takes off running. Uh, the other day, uh, you run when, you're, when there's an emergency. Yesterday, God always gives these random things I wasn't planning to have in my life. Literally, last night, Zoe goes into the restroom, and I hear her go, ah, and I'm like, I, like, I hear a weird thud, and then I'm like, I don't know what she said. I get in there, her finger's stuck in a drawer. I run. Like, I literally run. I say, are you trying to get to see if I could run, if I would run for you? You run when you're, when you're, when you're concerned, okay? And I go, and I free her finger from this place. We put ice on it. She's fine. But I'm telling you, I took off running. You would have seen sprinting occur uh, if you'd heard the same sounds. Dad cares. So he came running. I proved it. But, but this is what's happening. She cares. She is offended. She's come really to honor this one who has delivered her. And on this day, she's running because she's offended. This, the tomb has been really desecrated in important ways. They've taken the Lord out of the tomb. We do not even know where they've laid him. Can you imagine this one who has been humiliated in so many ways, now even his body is being treated like garbage. And so offense after offense has happened to her. This one who's been delivered from satanic oppression, trying to just honor him, you know, one last time, and, and she can't. Tomb's open. We think what probably happened is the women all went together, and after seeing the stone rolled away, Mary Magdalene took off running to the disciples. So the first clue is just this, empty tomb. Easter morning, empty tomb. The tomb was, was actually empty. The key thing to note is that they did not expect this. Now Jesus had said stuff, but as far as what's going on, they're not expecting this at all. I said this on Friday as well, but there were two other messianic-type people in that era. A guy named Simon bar Yora and Simeon bar Kochba. Two different time periods. But the, what, what happened was this. They were viewed as, they wondered, maybe these are messianic people. If he's a Messiah, he's going to deliver us. That's the plan. So, Whoever this is, he's going to deliver us. So the thought of him dying is entirely foreign to what they were expecting. And yet, when Jesus dies, and by the way, in both of those movements, when those guys died, when Rome killed them, their movements ended. When their leaders died, those movements ended. This is not what happened here. It took off. So they're not expecting this. That's the key. So what would account for a completely different story with Jesus? First unexpected clue, empty tomb. Second one is a folded face cloth. Folded face cloth. Look at verses 3 through 5. So Peter went out with the disciples, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together. But the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. So what's going on? They're both running Young legs outrun old legs. That's just how it works. Am I right, Pastor JC? And it's not my young legs we're talking about. So they, they, they're faster. And he gets there, and he sees enough daylight to look inside, and he sees linen cloths. John is who this is. Look at verses 6 to 7 now. Then Simon Peter came following him, and he went to the tomb, and he saw the linen cloths lying there, and the face cloth which had been on Jesus' head, was not lying on the linen cloth, was folded in a place by itself. A folded face cloth. Everyone say that. Folded face cloth. Like a, if I had, I'm going to say it, if I had been resurrected, I would go like this, right? <laughs> We're out of here. He's not in a hurry. Now, I don't know whether an angel folded or he did it, but all I can tell you, they're not in a hurry. When you fold, you're not in a hurry. You're just not in a hurry. Simon goes in, he goes to the tomb, he sees the linen cloths and the face cloth where Jesus' head was. It was literally folded. The thing that was covering his face, folded. In 8 through 10, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in, he saw and he, he believed. For as yet, they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciple went back to their home. The disciples went back to their homes. So John sees and actually he believes. Why? 
Let me tell you why. Because this was not a normal man. This man has seen, John has seen Jesus do incredible things. So unlike if your neighbor said, did something, you know, miraculous, where you'd be like, eh, no way. John has seen this man do incredible things. The context around him, he's a miracle worker. He has displayed authority over life and death. He controlled the weather. John would have known about that. He fed thousands. He spoke with authority. No one was like him. So John, upon seeing an empty grave and a folded face cloth and burial clothes, starts to believe, and he goes home. Key thing to remember is when he goes home, Mary, who's Jesus' mom, is probably there. John had been entrusted, like when Jesus is being crucified, he's like, you know, behold your mom, basically. He's like, take care of her, is what Jesus has done. And so when John goes home believing, let me tell you what I am convinced he did. He told mom, convinced. I don't know what happened. Graves open, cloth is folded, and I, and I, and I really think he believed. So the second clue is just an, a folded face cloth. A folded face cloth. Third, this final clue is, is a familiar voice. Look at verses 11 through 13. Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she, she stooped to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had, had lain, uh, one at the head and one at the feet. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord. I did not know where they have laid him. So now Mary stoops, she's looking in the tomb, uh, and she sees two angels. And she's crying. She's, again, come to prepare Jesus' body. This woman who knew what it meant was to be delivered, and they ask her a question. They ask her, why are you weeping? If you're, I mean, what are y'all thinking about that? Why are you weeping, Mary? Like, I'm literally at a grave that is missing the body. I'll tell you why I'm weeping. But they're engaging her mind, I think. They're inviting her to consider, why should you be weeping? And her reply is this, they've taken away my Lord. What beautiful words. They've taken away my Lord. I don't know where they've laid him. She is not put off by angels. She's still locked in of like, I need the king. She turned around. Look what it says next, verses 14 to 15. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing. She didn't know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Another question. Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you carried him away, just tell me where you've laid him. I'll take him, I'll take him away. So she turns around, she sees Jesus. Now, why didn't she recognize him? I have three possibilities. They're my others. Personal, academic, spiritual. Here we go. Personal is this. So my brother, years ago, I think I've told you this story before, uh, was flying, I don't know, up north somewhere in an airport. And he saw someone who's kind of like a family friend to us. His close as like a you know, relative, but they aren't actually relatives. And my brother went and picked this man up because he knew him. This is his family. And that guy was terrified because... I don't know you here. <laughs> right? So, yeah, I know you in Virginia. I don't know you in Chicago or wherever in the world they were. So he just is like, what is going on? But literally, he was, and they gave us gifts like every Christmas. We've been in their house hundreds, I mean, of times. This is, he knew my brother, and yet his, his framework did not allow him to exist. <laughs> okay? And this is, I don't know you, <laughs> like, except he knew him very well. So personal, that would be one way. And yet, she has, uh, grief and shock is another facet. Another is just academic. Right, there's a guy named Thomas Kuhn. He talked about the structure of scientific revolutions. And what he noticed was that paradigm shifts in science, right, bear with me, it's not going to be that long. Uh, paradigm shifts in science occurred after all this data would accumulate. So a shift from a given theory to another. It didn't just change with the new facts. It was like all this new data would accumulate, and then they'd go, okay, this is true. But what he also noticed was this, that even after the, the, the theory shifted, and they're like, this is what we think is true, people from the old paradigm would not just buy in. They'd kind of stand at a distance. They're like, I see all the facts, 
but I can't be there. The structure of scientific revolutions. It's a thing. Even if you know it's true, this is why yeah, a naturalist can't accept miracles. Because you think, no, they can't be miracles. Because the world is closed. Everything's physical. They literally can't enter that world emotionally. So I think it's possible that she doesn't have enough data yet, in my thinking, data points to shift her mind and to go, this is Jesus. Because she's not ready for a risen Jesus. She saw him die. This doesn't make any sense. Even if he's, she doesn't matter. I'm telling you, my own family, I saw that. But this, this is totally foreign. He no one was crucified like this. Academic. And the third is just spiritual. God could have just hindered her. So there you go. That's what I have. Whatever the case is, she says, tell me where his body is. I'll take him. Woman, why are you weeping? Jesus himself is talking to her. Why are you weeping? He asks her, why are you even weeping? Just, just tell me where his body is. She's looking at him. Just tell me where his body is. I'll take him. She's focused, completely determined, and she loves him. Verse 16, Jesus said to her, listen, Mary. He just says her name. And she turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabbani, which means teacher. She recognizes him now. He's been talking to her. Why are you weeping? He calls her name. And Mary believes. This would have been the best day of her life. Or one of them. She moves from going, I have no hope. This man who has delivered me from the demonic has been crucified. His tomb has been desecrated. They can't possibly have sold his body. Now he's alive. And I'm talking to him. He knows me. He knows my name. He knows everything about me. He calls me my name as one who knows me. It's a familiar voice. And kind of an amazing day. I think in recent days of answered prayer, of things that seemed impossible, prayer against human odds. You think this can't possibly be. And then God does something. He heals. And, and what seems impossible moves to exactly what's going on. A familiar voice. He knows her name. And quite frankly, he knows you by name. He knows everything about you. Every time Jesus would like engage with someone, they were like, he told me everything about me. He literally knows your life. He knew when you were born. He, knew every, he knows everything you've ever done. He knows the day that you will die. And he, he can call us by name. And on this day, he tells the girl who was formerly possessed by demons, he calls her by name, and she is in awe. Look at verse 17. Now, Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and, you, to, and your Father and to my God and your God. So here's what's happening here. Uh, is Mary is trying to cling to him as her rabbi, this one who taught her. And what Jesus is saying, like, I'm not just a rabbi. I'm going to co-reign with the Father. That's what's happening next. You're going to want to be close and that will happen one day. But you're, you're literally trying to hold on to the old way, and new things are coming. Verse 18, Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And he said, to them, said these things to her. Mary's story, I have seen the Lord. It would have been the greatest day of her life. Mary, Mary Magdalene saw Jesus alive. She knows it. She believes it. Against all odds, she's looking at this one who has conquered the grave. What about us? Someone said this, well, while graveyards may remind us of the brevity of life, the resurrection ensures the brevity of death. While graveyards may remind us of the brevity of life, the resurrection ensures the brevity of death. When you go to a graveyard, there's this sense of hopelessness, honestly, and the fact is, like everyone here, unless Jesus comes first, we're, we're going to die. That's more of it unless you know that Christ conquered the grave. And it reminds us, when you go to a funeral, again, more blessed to be in a house of mourning, a house of rejoicing. Why? It's because you're aware for a moment what's really true. Graveyards remind us of the shortness of our lives. We're going to have really short lives. And yet the resurrection ensures the brevity of death, that it's only a glimpse. Like literally, death is not the end. That literally the believer has hope, not wish, expectation, that the moment I die, I'll be present with the Lord. Three unexpected clues, an empty tomb, 
folded face cloth, familiar voice. Now, if you're a skeptical type person, like I was at one point in my life, you might be thinking, that's not even possible. This is, this is not possible. But I just want to remind you of a few things. Uh, I just think it's always worth having in your head somewhere. A lot of times people think of faith as a wish, a jump in the dark. I know a lot of people think like that. Like, to, to believe is really to just jump in the dark. And I want to tell you, there are a few things you need to know. One is this, if God exists, and he does, then you have no defense against miracles. I like what C.S. Lewis said. If God exists, you have no defense against miracles. He can do whatever in the world he wants. You are a miracle. Your existence was a miracle. This man was abnormal. He was not like everyone else. There were three things in specific that I want to make sure you know about. Death by crucifixion. There was a crucifixion. Disciples' belief. Yeah, you can echo it. So disciples' belief. I didn't tell you to. They're like, I don't know. Are you going to do that one? Yeah, I'm going to do that one. Uh, and then Paul's transformation. So death by crucifixion, disciples' belief, and Paul's transformation. There are a lot of other reasons, but let me tell you, those are three that literally non-Christians agree on. They literally think it is almost unanimous that Jesus really did die on a cross. These are people who don't believe in God. They believe that Jesus Christ died on a cross. Second, that his disciples really believed that he was raised from the dead. They, they really believed that. Now, the key thing to know is that no one's expecting this, all right? But they were so convinced, actually, that many of them would die for their faith. Now, as you think about that, we're used to martyrs. Like, we'll hear martyrs all, all the time now, right? You know, a martyr died for their faith, right? That's something we've heard. But there's a huge difference between modern-day martyrs, if I died for my faith, than if they died for theirs, all right? See, if I died for my faith today, I do it because I believe it's true. If the disciples, and they did, die for their faith, they'd have to die for something they know is false. These are not the same. I don't die for lies. And if you're a liar, you really don't have that much integrity anyways. <laughs> what are the odds? They're, so these disciples would have died for something they knew was false. So, belief, so death by crucifixion, disciples believe the third is Paul. I say this all the time when I keep saying it. I said this in, in, in Mexico. They're like, why do you keep saying Osama bin Laden? What does that even mean? And here's what this means. Paul is like Osama bin Laden. Paul is like Osama bin Laden. Paul hated Christianity. Paul delighted at Stephen's death. He holds the cloak, watching him, and said, good, this is good. He's hunting the church. He puts people in jail boldly, and he's happy about it, and he thinks he's doing good. Then he meets Jesus alive. That's why people who are non-Christian, not just Christians, really believe Paul's transformation is something you have to deal with historically. They believe it. They believe Paul was changed. You don't have to like it. That's literally what they think. So I was telling this guy, so we're in, in Mexico, final story from Mexico, um, we're traveling, and uh, one of the drivers in one of the place, um, we're sitting there, and I thought, well, I'm going to talk to you about Jesus. So basically what happened was, um, I asked him, hey, do you, do you go to a church somewhere? And uh, his response was, I said this in Spanish, his response was, yes, there are churches in the area. Let me ask the question again. Do you go to church anywhere? That was my question. You understand that, right? Yes, there are churches in the area was his response. I ignored that. I waited a while. I was like, all right, clearly you're not interested. And he really wasn't. He was not interested at all. But I thought, well, you need Jesus. So I'll just tell you my story. So I did at some point in time later. I wasn't all I talked about. We were hanging out. Uh, but I told him in my life a number of reasons why I really believe this is, this is really true. That Christianity is not something that just works for me. I literally think it's true. A few reasons. One is void. Void. Everyone say Void. I remember what it was like to do whatever in the world I wanted and it still be hollow. There's a void that is never satisfied outside of God. You do whatever in the world you want. My uncle was a multi, multi-millionaire, okay? And I still remember to this day where I was, where he's this $3 million gazebo, and he comments on his Ferrari and all this stuff. He's, he's, with, he's no longer with us. Um, he said, this stuff will literally never make you happy. Now, if I said that, I'd be like, you don't even know. And I'm like, you are correct. But he did. And he wasn't kidding. This was not a token statement. 
all the stuff you can buy in the world. Everyone knows this. Everyone says this. And still people try. There's a void that can never be satisfied outside of God. So I told him that. I'm like, look, it's like you're living like you want. And it's dead. The second clue is guilt. Guilt. That, that the fact is everyone here, that we know full well, if we were to give an account for our lives, that we're guilty. That there's this moral burden that we feel, or we're ignoring it. And the only solution is actually forgiveness. Okay? So my life, I'm feeling, really, Psalm 51 was the one in my mind, where David talks about his sin kind of crushing him, that God in his goodness has is, is crushed him. He's like, my, my bones are broken underneath your hand. And, and you're fully aware of your guilt, and you can't hide, and he knows it. And, and yet he talks about his ability to forgive, and what Jesus did on the cross was literally pay for my guilt. So second, first is void, second is just guilt. Third is the resurrection itself. So I told him, there's a real cross. Non-Christians agree on this. Disciples really believed this, and it was great cost. It wasn't convenient for them. weren't big churches. wasn't like your million, you know, billionaire. None of that mess. There was nothing except persecution. And then Paul, a guy wasn't even there at the beginning. And this is just a short story, by the way. We're just on a short ride. Resurrection. And the last time I told him was this. Pursuit. That God is pursuing us. This is, this is the story of, of any believer. There's this awareness that God is chasing us. That was mine. I'm doing what I want, and yet I feel like I'm not alone. I feel like I'm caught all the time. C.S. Lewis, story I told you a hundred times. He, he tells the story of, of like you're, you're playing hide and seek, and you hear a noise in the house that shouldn't be there. It's children playing hide and seek. You hear a noise that's not supposed to be here. And, and the reason is, it's like he's chasing you. And Lewis was running from him. And the Bible says we're, we're all like that, kind of. We're not looking for him to reign. God's pursuit is real. And the last thing I told him was about identity theft. I think it's worth you knowing. So many times people do stupid things in the name of Jesus. And Jesus gets blamed for it. And I just want to make sure you put this in your systems. There's a difference between Jesus and identity theft. I told this guy this. So let me tell you what's very often... In Catholic circles, you're aware of hypocrisy. My very close friend in Colombia talked about these, these priests that had these monstrous places. They fed no poor people at all, and they used their power to do this stuff. And I was like, look, make sure you're clear. It's the difference between Jesus and people who use him. And so I said this, if someone took your credit card and bought a bunch of junk with your credit card, you would know that is not you, right? So make sure you distinguish Jesus from others. So these four clues in Mexico, these were real ones. So I, that was about all I said to him. But we, took, we happened to ride the next day. He gave us another run. And this, was, this, is, this isn't in huge, in case you're like bracing yourself for a huge, exciting finish. But this was huge to me, and there's why. There was no response. He really was not particularly interested, I thought. The next day, we're just riding. I'm like, look, he needs to know I actually care about him, because I did. And I just was hanging out, and I just said, you know, hey, if you could travel anywhere in the world, where would you go? He's taking us to the airport. I think he's aware of travel. And he said, where is that place that Jesus was? Was it Israel? He goes, yeah, Israel. I'd like to go there. And I thought, incredible. God is doing something. His name is, is Ater. You can pray for his, his soul. But honestly, on the outside, it looked like nothing's going on. But I know full well God is pursuing us. He's pursuing you, Okay. Until he reigns in your life. I don't care if you're raised in the church. You were taught all this stuff from the beginning. Irrelevant. Doesn't matter at all. It's a bonus. Okay. But until Jesus is reigning in your life, you will live with a void. You will carry your own guilt. The resurrection will seem fake to you. And you'll be avoiding God. What is keeping you from him? If you're a believer today, let me just remind you. Graveyards remind us of the brevity of life. And the resurrection ensures the brevity of death. This is not the end. Thank God. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, um, I thank you for this life. This is a woman who, if you were scheduling to make a, a nice, you know, fraud, you would not use her. You would use Joseph of Arimathea. And yet, one of the first witnesses to your resurrection 
is a lady whose reputation would have been abnormally uh, unwelcome. And yet you don't care. <laughs> you just do your thing. Father, I, I know among us there are people who don't know you. So I pray that you would uh, show the inadequacy of the reasons. That there would be a sense of, I'm just done fighting you. That you'd open eyes. That you would pursue some more. Lord, I pray for those who know you already, that you would remind us again of this foundation we have in Christ, that you have made a way for people just like us to belong to you. I pray that your spirit would, would strengthen faith. There'd be a deeper conviction today that our king conquered the grave, and it's because of that we don't, we don't fear death. We look forward to the day we'll be with you. Not because we're, we're morbid people, but because we really know you conquered the grave. So, Father, do what only you can do. I pray that your spirit would pursue us. I pray for hatred for them, for his salvation. And I pray for anyone else who needs the same. It is in Christ's name.